Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 364th episode, we have a bunch of news, largely from SVP. And I'm going to be talking a bunch about Hesper Ornus and Ichthyornis. Nice. Those more aquatic type dinosaurs Mm -hmm. from the Mesozoic. And Sabrina's got some museum news. We also have an interview with Sterling Nesbitt all about the origins of dinosaurs and other Triassic weirdos. So if you're into Triassic stuff, it's a very exciting interview. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't you be? It's how dinosaurs got their start. Yeah, more people should be into Triassic. The Cretaceous and the Jurassic are always the ones getting all the attention. (laughs) The Triassic is very important, too. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Paleoskinkus. That's a fun one to say. Mm -hmm. And, of course, our fun fact. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we want to thank... Wouter, Arlosaurus, Robert, Scott, Risa, the Georges family, Rogan, Bill Jago, Jeremy Stevens, and Gordon Adon and Jackie Cephalosaurus. Dad, thank you so much for being part of our community and supporting us and making sure that we can keep this show going. Hopefully you enjoy our SVP coverage. That's one of our big events of the year. And then, of course, we do other stuff, too. And we have all kinds of benefits and You know, you can be a part of a larger community of dinosaur enthusiasts. So if you haven't joined yet, you can at patreon.com slash inodino. Yeah, that bonus SVP stuff will be coming out. We're still getting through all of the papers and everything so and presentations. So we're not ready to record that and release it yet, but soon. After going through, I think, maybe a third of the non-dinosaur stuff so far, I can tell you there's a lot of good stuff there. There is. So jumping into the news, I'm going to kick it off, even though I said it was going to be Hesperornis and Ichthyornis, I'm going to talk about Hadrosaurus. It's a very different kind of dinosaur. <laughs> it is. But you mentioned this last week with the Hadrosaur paleo art of like the Ramphitheca, mm-hmm. also known as like the beak, sort of coming down over the mouth, almost like it's got, I don't know, some jewelry hanging off its mm-hmm. lip or something. Very pretty art. <laughs> yeah. So that piece of art came from a talk by Evan Alger Mayer, and of course presenting on behalf of others, talking about how Sorolophene and Lambiosaurine hadrosaurs both had keratinous structures over their bony duckbills. Ooh. Yeah. And Sorolophenes, again, are stuff like Parasaurolophus. That's how I always remembered Mm -hmm. (laughs) Sorolophene, like Parasaurolophus. And so they got that big thing sticking off the back of their head in some cases. So you got the crest and you've got the beak. Yes. And then Lambiosaurines are ones more like Edmontosaurus, where they might have some structures maybe up on top of the snout bulging up a little bit or maybe farther back in the head. But it's not going to be this huge extended thing behind the head, at least that we found so far. I wouldn't be surprised if we found it and it mixed up the whole tree because that always <laughs> happens, like with centrosaurines and chasmosaurines, mm-hmm. where it's like centrosaurines have the big center horn and then you find a chasmosaurine that has it. It's like, ah, oh, usually, I guess. So Ramphitheca, again, would have extended a little bit beyond the end of the preserved bone. And that's usually all we have when we have a dinosaur fossil is just the bone. But we know that in general, you know, whether it's claws, if it's a beak, if it's a scute, there's likely a keratin covering that was significantly bigger than just the bone. So yeah. in life, it would have had a lot. I like thinking about that with the claws and how they'd be so much bigger. Oh, yeah. If yeah. It wasn't just the bone. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know exactly how much bigger they would have been, but I, and some of them we do. We have like some of the birds and things mm-hmm. where there's a little bit of an outline in the keratin. You can kind of see it in those like lithograph type pressings but for some of the bigger claws we really don't know is if the claw was like only half the size or if it was like 80 percent. but it, it was definitely bigger with the claw sheath over it so that's the same thing with these ramphitheca or the beaks over the top of the bone we know specifically that there was definitely some keratin covering the beak there because we actually have seen bits of it preserved just like we've seen bits of those claws preserved in certain fossils And other times we actually have impressions from the rock where the Ramphitheca eroded away, but the rock sort of formed its solid structure around the fossil before that. So it leaves that impression of what used to be there. But we don't have anything where it extends far beyond the end of the skull 
the end of its, you know, scully beak part, <laughs> unfortunately. So we're working with only impressions that are really close to the face. Because of that, probably, usually the Ramphathika is recreated as ending just beyond the end of the skull. And there are a lot of examples of that. You know, you see in Paleo all the time. If you're lucky, they actually include the Ramphathika. Sometimes it's almost like they leave the keratin off completely. But in modern paleo art, they usually have the keratin there and it sort of overlaps, gives a little bit of an overbite covering up. So when they open their mouth just a millimeter or two, it's not seeing straight into the mouth. You know, there's a little bit of covering hanging over it. But there are some good clues we can use to try to figure out how much that Ramphathika would have extended beyond the end of the snout or up in the other direction, you know, above the head, because birds have Ramphathika that stick out all sorts of different directions <laughs> that you can't tell just by looking at the skull. So what they were doing is they're looking at AMNH FARB 5060, which is a serolophene hadrosaur, obviously at the American Museum of Natural History. And Therefore, it doesn't have a big crazy crest behind its head. You know, you can think of more Edmontosaurus of a look. And it actually has an impression in one of its fenestra, sort of the antorbital fenestra, the one in front of the eyes on the top of the snout. And in that impression, you can see a lot of details of sort of what was pressed up against it when the rock fossilized. Hmm. So usually it's interpreted as like internal structures. So you can see maybe a little bit of vasculature and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but also possibly scale impressions. Ooh, so weird. Yeah. And the scale impressions are really the key because I think we've talked about it with lips and how the types of scales vary around the edge of lips. And if you could get a scale impression from what was on top of the skull, you might be able to tell if it was headed towards a lip or if it was headed towards more of like a reptilian border of a mouth. They're doing the same sort of thing, but they're trying to extrapolate it out a little bit farther. So basically, they looked at over 200 living birds to and the different skin texture and, you know, basically scale texture around the head to see if there was a connection between that skin texture and like where the Ramphathika grew up and you know like if it's bulging out in this direction does that affect the skin that's a couple inches away in some fashion or another and basically long story short is it's really variable so there are rough correlations but it's it's not very predictive one of the best ones was that the ornamented species were more likely to have a cornified frontal which <laughs> Basically means... What does that mean? Yeah, so like cornified is like solidified, basically, or like keratinized. Mm. And again, the frontal is sort of the bone in front of the eyes on top of the snout. So that's not the exact spot we're looking at on AMNH FARB 5060. But in that area, you can also get a little bit of detail, but it's still... So like that cornified frontal ratio is like the ones that are ornamented are 68% versus 24% uncornified and that's if you have that frontal piece mm -hmm. so like 68 to 24 it's like that's it's just not that predictive right so you can have that there and you can be like well it's twice as likely to have this sort of cornified frontal here but it's just yeah it's, it's not a great predictive value and the other ones that were actually a little bit worse than that but based on the types of structures on the birds so like for example, the ones that are sort of lambiosaurine-like, like a cassowary cask, they think that they were probably cornified. So that big, crazy trombone <laughs> crest coming by off the back of the Parasaurolophus head, they think probably had keratin covering it. Oh, wow. And then since that bone is really an extension of the premaxilla at the very front of the snout, and then it extends back up over the head and then way by you know, beyond the back of it, mm -hmm. it would have potentially been like a big, smooth, keratinous covering all the Ooh. way from the top back all the way over and then maybe hanging down a little bit in the front of the mouth. That's cool. Yeah. Just so much larger than we thought and maybe more colorful. Yeah. Yeah, it could be more colorful. Certainly, it would have likely looked like a more continuous structure because I, I feel like as a kid, I always imagine that thing hanging off the back of the head as one structure and the snout is a totally different thing. But it was really likely more unified into a single keratinized structure. 
I'm thinking something that looks like a helmet almost. Yeah, basically. Like uh, one of those bicycle helmets if it like came down more on the front side. Mm -hmm. You know how it like extends really far back. Then for Seralophines, what they think is they may have had either a cornified or pliable covering over their nasal passages. So they couldn't really, you know, these were really in like the 60-40 sort of ratios with not a whole lot of predictive ability. And so that means that there was likely a covering there, we know, just from a, a few impressions here and there. And occasionally there are bones that stick up and look like they're supporting some sort of structure. But we can't really tell if it was a hard structure like we think it likely was in Lambiosaurians or if it was a softer structure. And that discovery is the one where they ended up including that fantastic piece of art mm -hmm. by meta almala of gripposaurus with a big showy beak <laughs> oh yeah it's stunning yeah and the contrast too really dramatic i love it yeah and i think that amnh specimen was uh gripposaurus which is why they picked gripposaurus for mm -hmm. that they did say a couple little things. So even though they couldn't tell if it was soft tissue or if it was hard, they said it probably wasn't inflatable since in birds, anything that's inflatable is usually on the neck. And then on rare occasion, it's on top of the snout, which is where the snood is on turkeys. I had to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, turkeys above their beak, you know, like actually kind of behind and on top of the beak is a big, weird, fleshy, long thing that hangs off called a snood. Hmm. So that's just a weird thing that happens. And maybe a dinosaur had that, but it's unlikely in these cases. But if it was going to be somewhere, it would probably be in a seralophene and not a lambiosaurine. So that's a little update on what we think about hadrosaur ornamentation. I love how we were learning more and more about the details of what these dinosaurs looked like. Yeah. This one is a little, you know, it's trying to extrapolate from modern birds. Sure. So it doesn't really have much predictive ability, but it's sort of... But why not? There are some crazy looking modern birds. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's highly probable, especially considering all of the different bony structures and like display structures that we found. There were certainly a lot of soft tissue and keratinized things that we just don't have preservation because, like, if Stegosaurus was growing plates mm -hmm. 90 million years before dinosaurs went extinct, something else crazy happened after that. <laughs> At least one crazy thing. Yeah. So now getting into the Hesperornis side of things. All right. There was a poster by Tomonori Tanaka and others, and they were talking about how Hesperornithiforms unsurprisingly, are mostly found in aquatic deposits, but there are some from terrestrial deposits in North America and Mongolia. So, and they happen to find another Hesperornithiform bone in southwest Mongolia in the Gobi Desert, which again back then was still not that different than the modern Gobi Desert. It certainly wasn't like the Western Interior Seaway going through where a lot of the other Hesperornithiforms are from. And it's probably not a new species. They tentatively assigned it to Brodavis, which is a genus that actually has four assigned species spanning about the last 15 million years of the Cretaceous in North America and Mongolia. It's a successful species. It is. And just like other Hesperornithiforms, the recreations of it are very cormorant-like. Cormorants are really awesome, and I didn't know about them until I started researching dinosaurs, but... Basically, they swim with their feet. <laughs> They've got little tiny wings that are essentially just big enough to fly, but they got big old feet for swimming. And some of them can dive up to 150 feet below the water. Hmm. They're really cool birds. They're very agile underwater. They're, they look better underwater than they do above water. Like penguins? Yeah, basically. As if they use a slightly different propulsion method. So we think Hesperornithiforms also use their feet basically paddling around but they have a really streamlined body so it still worked pretty well without having front flippers unless they would use their wings a tiny bit maybe when it comes to broad avis it was probably similar in size to the great cormorant putting it at about five kilograms very roughly or 10 pounds so this is one where we we have like a very good modern analog actually mm -hmm. hesper ornithiforms and cormorants seem to be very similar both physically and, you know, in the way they likely behaved and stuff, except that Hesperornithiforms had teeth. 
(laughs) (laughs) That is different. That is a difference. Yeah. So, and that might have affected their diet and things like that. But overall, they have a lot of similarities. And one of those similarities is that they have a tarso metatarsus, which is formed from several bones in the middle of the foot fusing together. And since birds have really long feet, you know, it's not just like, I always think of my foot when I'm thinking about these bones fusing together, Mm -hmm. but birds have those crazy long foot bones like T-Rex, you know, where it looks like it's part of the leg, basically. It's so long and it gives it that almost backwards knee bend look because the ankle is so far from the toe pads. And since it's, you know, such a long bone, the tarso metatarsus is actually considered a long bone, just like in us, how we have, you know, the tibia and fibula, they also have the tarso metatarsus as a long bone. So it's a really useful bone for comparing things. And it's also really important in Hesperornithoforms because they had that unique foot posture for swimming. So they're a good bone to compare and they're also useful for identifying new species, which is why we only have that tarso metatarsus, but we can say, okay, it looks a lot like Bro Davis. So what the authors wanted to look at with this new bone is that since Mongolia is further inland than other places where Hesperornithoforms have been found, they wanted to look at the aquatic adaptations and if they varied throughout its range and between species. In order to do that, they looked at the microstructure of the bone, and fortunately they have a bunch of tarsometatarsals to compare to, and they could use relative cortical bone thickness, or RCBT as an analogy for how deep they dive. Basically, RCBT is just how thick the bone is. <laughs> it's a very fancy name for it's like the inverse of hollowness. So something that's like 80% RCBT is like 20% hollow in the middle. Hmm. So just like the last study, they started with modern birds and they found that in cormorants, thicker bone, also known as the higher RCBT values, is somewhat correlated with how deep the species dives. It's a little bit better of a correlation than that, you know, texture of bone to what sort of display structures and how keratinized it is on hadrosaurs, but it's not that much better because it's still like biology so messy that you never get like one to one perfect, you know, R squared value of one on your regressions. But they did find that in marine environments where the species tend to dive deeper versus freshwater inland environments, there is a higher RCPT for those deeper diving marine individuals. And then bringing that over to Hesperornithiforms, they found that Hesperornis had the highest RCBT above 90%, even higher than the deepest diving cormorants that they tested, which were in the 60 to 80% range. And the new Mongolian Brodavis individual had the lowest RCBT of a Hesperornithiform at about 66%. So it's sort of in a normal range for a deep diving cormorant but a lot lower than Esperornis. So it's a little bit difficult to interpret there, but it is possible that this new Broad Avis lived in a more inland environment, or you could say, you know, less marine, more freshwater or shallower water that they weren't diving as deep into as Hesperornis. All of those things are roughly equivalent since that's what we have to compare to now. All of those things are directly linked. Interestingly, the North American Brodavis, Brodavis americanus, had a RCBT of 86% or 20% higher than the Mongolian specimen, which is interesting since they gave them the same genera. (laughs) Yeah. So I I wonder if those will get split. It's unusual that you see four dinosaur species valid in the same genus for a long time. Especially since they're in two different areas. Yeah, and across 15 million years. Mm -hmm. Kind of surprised those haven't been split, but... We'll see. So keeping the Hesperornis train rolling, there was another talk by Blake Chapman, and this one was about the Western Interior Seaway. More specifically, it's not about the Mongolian individuals. So as a quick background, the Western Interior Seaway covered most of Central North America for up to 30 million years is how they put it. It's a long time. Yeah, I I mean... I think it's being generous because I'm pretty sure at at the very end of the Cretaceous, there wasn't much of any Western Interior Seaway left anymore. But yeah, it was definitely millions of years, probably tens of millions of years. So it's in the roughly 96 to 66 million year old time frame. 
and Hesperornithiforms lived in the Western Interior Seaway during the Campanian, which is about 83 to 72 million years ago, at least the ones that they're studying here. They had teeth in their jaws. They might have eaten cephalopods, crustaceans, and or fish. Crustaceans are much easier to eat when you have teeth. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, those are, are tricky to eat without teeth. And then they have similarities, again, with cormorants and diving ducks. So if you don't know what a cormorant is, a diving duck is a pretty bad analogy, but <laughs> it's, the, it's sort of the right ballpark. It's got the big webbed feet, spends a lot of time on the water. It could dive a little bit. But Hesperornis ate quite a variety and had the widest diversity of where it lived. And also, we know that it came in a lot of sizes. We have specimens ranging from about 80 centimeters up to about two meters or about two and a half to six and a half feet long. This is big, six and a half feet. That's yep. that's large. That's bigger than a penguin, that's for sure. Yep. Just a real quick plug. Uh, Hesperornis was a dinosaur of the day in episode 250, if you want to go back and hear more about that one specifically. Yeah, it's a, it's a cool one. And they've been found all throughout the Western Interior Seaway. Actually, way larger range than you usually see for a dinosaur. I guess it helps when you can fly and or swim to cover a lot of distance because they literally go from the southernmost end by Arkansas all the way up through the Canadian Arctic. (laughs) Like really, you know, because that's the Western Interior Seaway. It's subdivided all of North America, Mm -hmm. you know, and we find them all over the place. I didn't realize just how many Hesperornis specimens had been found, but there's tons of deposits all over the place, all across the U.S. and Canada. They thrived. They really did. I don't think there have been any found in Mexico yet. I didn't notice any on his map, at least. Based on the type of rock and, you know, potentially gut contents or other things that are fossilized with it, it appears that most of these Hesperornis individuals were in marine sediments, but some of them are known from lakes and rivers in Wyoming and Montana. So we know that at least some of them were freshwater, or at least in freshwater some of the time. But these authors specifically wanted to know about the species distribution of Hesperornis, because they're focusing specifically on Hesperornis and not other Hesperornithiforms. And so they used specialized distribution models, or SDMs, to estimate where they likely lived. They actually had two type of models of those SDMs. They had occupancy models and generalized linear models. And generalized linear models are a little bit more obvious, I guess you could say, where it's like, we found this in this area, we didn't find it in that place, let's try to extrapolate where it lived. But that's not super accurate when you're talking about fossils, because there are so many false negatives where you don't find something, but Mm -hmm. it very likely lived there and it just didn't happen to fossilize. Whereas those occupancy models work a little bit better at eliminating the problems with false negatives. But unfortunately, you can only use the occupancy models if you have multiple samples from a single site so they didn't have as many areas to sample for their more robust model they still had a lot though so for their glm generalized linear model they had 61 localities in the western interior seaway and hesperornis was at 26 of those sites or 43 percent that's a lot it is it's, it's it's a lot of hesperornis going on And for the occupancy model, they had 22 sites and 11 of them had Hesperornis. So on half of the sites, (laughs) it's really, it's amazingly, I didn't realize how successful Hesperornis was in in both distribution around the world and within Western Interior Seaway and for length of time and how often it gets fossilized. It's really cool. Kind of makes sense then that it was a bone wars dinosaur. Oh, true. Yeah. Because the odds of finding it are higher. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, The most interesting takeaway I saw from the model is that it predicted that when there was an elasmosaur present, it was likely that there wasn't going to be a Hesperornis around. And remember, elasmosaurs (laughs) are plesiosaurs with like really long necks and then a little skinny head with like lots of big pokey teeth. They probably ate fish. They probably weren't big enough to directly eat Hesperornis because Hesperornis was probably too big, especially the adults. But they might have been competing for food. Mm -hmm. They could maybe do some damage if they wanted to. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, the biggest damage might just be that they gobbled up all the food Mm -hmm. and Hesperonis didn't have anything left to eat. (laughs) We also know from gut contents. Ooh. Yeah. That elasmosaurs 
fed on fish, crustaceans, and cephalopods. So the exact same diet. Yeah, essentially, yeah. So Hesperornis might have just tried to stay away from them or vice versa mm-hmm. so that they could get food. It's also possible that Hesperornis preferred high latitudes because we see a little bit more Hesperornis in that, you know, northern area than we do down by Arkansas, for example. But this might be attributed to lots of other things. For example, it could be for mating. Maybe they went to high latitudes to mate because we know a lot of birds that do that today. And so if they went up there and then when they were coming back, they may have died along the way because really long migrations are super strenuous. If you run out of food, if there's conditions they're not used to, or if there's a storm that comes through when they're already in a weakened state, they're likely to get fossil or likely to get killed and then more likely to get fossilized than if they're just swimming through. So several juveniles that were found way in the north might just be due to the fact that they were born there and then didn't make it all the way back to their southern range before getting fossilized. And when I say northern, like above 50 degrees north, paleo latitude is pretty far north, Mm -hmm. well into Canada. They didn't specifically talk about predators, or at least they couldn't find them in their modeling, but they proposed some predators that might have gone after Hesperornis, and that includes Tylosaurus, which is a large mosasaur, obviously has a mouth big enough and with large enough teeth to mm-hmm. take care of a two-meter-long Hesperornis. Also, a two-meter-long human would <laughs> be in trouble. <laughs> and it could have also been sharks. There were sharks back then. There have been sharks for hundreds of millions of years, and they're always happy to chomp on something human-sized swimming through. Keyword human size, not human taste. (laughs) Yeah, I I suppose that's true. Preferably probably something with more blubber and meat than our bony bodies. They also mentioned, too, that we could make the model better by looking for potential prey distributions. So I don't know, though, because when it's so many different things like fish. Yeah, there's fish everywhere. You're going to find them everywhere. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why there's Hesperonis everywhere, though. One last really brief Hesperonis talk which was presented by Daniel Williams, was about a microsite collection from the Upper Hell Creek, also known as Late Maastrichtian. So this is one of the very last dinosaurs that would have lived. It was found in Garfield County, Montana. I like microsite, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) Apparently it's a very small site. And they mentioned that they found two femora. They found a right and left femur there, so they don't think that the site had been dug through previously but i think that was all that they found Hmm. well it's a microsite yeah that's true (laughs) (laughs) that essentially they think that it's probably a ornithorae or a nithorid and that's a group that includes hesperornis so when they put it into their phylogeny it came out as a sister taxa of hesperornis but again it's just one bone so it's not super useful interestingly though One analysis showed it as a basal loon and grebe, or at least the group that includes loons and grebes, which are other aquatic dinosaurs. I mean, modern birds. Mm -hmm. But that might be completely wrong since it's just a femur. It's an, an initial analysis. Yeah. And we'll have to see if they find any more bones because it looks like it has the right shape for foot propelled swimming, like a cormorant or a Hesperornis. But It may have had features that made it a little bit more capable on land, like a diving duck, for example. And I don't think of diving ducks as being particularly capable on land, but I guess they're better than cormorants. (laughs) So maybe that's where this one will end up. Bringing up diving ducks a lot. And then rounding out the avial and evolution and biology session of SVP, we've got our ichthyornis paper. And unfortunately... Most of this talk is I'm not allowed to talk about because it's still in press, and, but it's super exciting. So I want to talk about the little bits that I can. So the title of the paper is 40 New Specimens of Ichthyornis. That's so many. Yeah, that's that's really what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's 40 new specimens of Ichthyornis. It's crazy. And because Ichthyornis has been previously said to be close to the origin of modern birds, It's a really important dinosaur to research when you're interested in avian evolution. And they also lived for a pretty long time in the roughly 95 to 83 million year ago time frame. So 
finding 40 new specimens is a huge deal. They're also all considered to be from one species. So unlike the Hesper ornithiform brodavis, we were talking about that had four species. This is all just one. With 40, too, you probably have a growth series, you can see. It's just, you know, the possibilities are really endless when you get so many specimens. It's like actually a statistically significant sampling that you have, and you can learn things from it rather than just saying like, well, we think probably, but this bone might not be representative of the species. It's easier to see what they have in common to and what's an individual variation, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's awesome. So the only individual I can talk about is KUVP5969, And by the way, KUVP is the University of Kansas, which is really cool because Kansas does not get a lot of love in the dinosaur world, but (laughs) apparently they got some pretty cool ichthyornis stuff. This one is quite small. It's humerus and ulna just by looking at the graphic they put up were about six centimeters or very roughly two inches long. So you think about like your upper arm if it was only two inches long. And again, this is a bird. So they need relatively large arms. So this is probably a juvenile. And so like you said, yeah, maybe there's some growth series information that might come out of this. But again, I can't say too much else until it gets published. Tease. Yeah. (laughs) But there's some really cool Ichthyorna stuff coming up soon with 40 new specimens. It's amazing. (laughs) I couldn't not mention it. Uh, One last thing I want to talk about for SVP for this week. There's still a lot to cover like Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the episode. But there were a lot of great talks and posters this year around diversity and inclusion, and there were also some specific diversity sessions. And there were some great key takeaways, you know, like uh, self-educating, reaching out to people uh, in private, especially, you know, if you're working with somebody that's uh, in one of these groups, support them, listen, brainstorm together, ask how you can help, especially if you're somebody's supervisor, And don't be afraid to ask questions and keep in mind uh, somebody's had a great quote, you know, no one's trying to be difficult. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Especially if someone has specific needs. It's not because they're trying to be difficult. It's just because they need this extra feature or extra help with something. And also when it comes to field work or conferences, uh, you know, things that require travel, you want to keep in mind safety, harassment and first aid training, how a particular location may affect whether or not someone can get there safely. Like if there's a dig site in an area where people may be prejudiced, then, you know, things to watch out for. Yeah, the thing I found the most interesting was the importance on sort of planning ahead and thinking about what issues might come up and how you can deal with them, whether that's staying in groups or if it's having a strategy to leave if there's a really difficult situation. Apparently, having that plan in place helped a lot of people when they had that in advance. So, yeah. So we learned about a lot of great resources, and we'll share them in the show notes for anyone who's interested. Moving on to non-SVP news, because there's always other dinosaur news. Dippy, the Diplodocus, is coming back to the Natural History Museum in London. Oh, it's done with its countrywide tour? Yeah. In 2017, Dippy went on tour to every county in the UK, had over 2 million visitors, so that's pretty successful. Mm, Yeah. And now Dippy's going to be in a temporary installation starting next summer that's going to run until December at the Natural History Museum. Just piling onto that success, like not only were there over 2 million visitors, but Dippy raised a lot of money from traveling and they're calling it the Dippy effect. (laughs) So it's only going to be on temporary display. Well, after that, and that exhibition or installation is going to highlight Dippy's tour, then the museum's going to announce what happens to Dippy next. So it sounds like Dippy will will not be going away anytime soon for a long period of time anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems like it'd be a pretty valuable replica because it is a replica, but, you know, it was on display for so long and so many people have emotional attachments to it. I could see any number of dinosaur museums being happy to have that original Dippy yeah. in their collection. Even the Natural History Museum. So some quick background on Dippy. Dippy first came to that museum in 1905 King Edward VII said that he wanted a Diplodocus specimen, and Andrew Carnegie commissioned it. In World War II, they hid Dippy in the basement. They, Dippy came back out <laughs> after the war. And Dippy's been in films, including Paddington, and one of our dinosaurs is missing. So yeah, lots of history there, lots of culture, lots of associations. I'm sure they'll find somewhere to put Dippy. Yeah. Over in the States, the University of Wyoming's American Heritage Center has a new interactive exhibit, 
that features a 3D digital replica of the animatronic Triceratops from the first King Kong movie back in 1931. Cool. Yeah. They used photogrammetry. Uh, the original is made of foam, so it is very fragile. I'm surprised it's even still around. A lot of times those things are completely gone or just the metal <laughs> structure from underneath. Mm-hmm. Maybe it had been well enough preserved. Yeah, that's pretty good. But this 3D virtual replica now allows people to interact with the model. Oh, cool. Could be fun. In Buffalo, New York, you can see the exhibit Antarctic Dinosaurs at the Buffalo Museum of Science, where you can touch fossils from Antarctica, learn about how excavations work there, see Cryolophosaurus. This exhibit opens February 5th, and you can buy tickets starting next month. Now, thank you to Liam, who shared this one with us. So from now until January 2nd, you can see the exhibit Dinosaur Discoveries, Ancient Fossils, New Ideas at Flint Hills Discovery Center in Manhattan, Kansas. So (laughs) Kansas is coming up a couple times in this episode. So you can touch fossil casts. You can see life-size models, learn about CT scans and how modern paleontologists work. It was created by a bunch of museums, AM&H, Cal Academy of Science, Field Museum, Houston Museum of Natural Science, and North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. There's a lot of big name museums. I know. Must be a cool exhibit. Yeah. And then last, going up into Canada, the Royal Tyrrell Museum in Drumheller has five Guinness World Records, (laughs) all for their dinosaur fossil collection. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They include the most complete fossil of its kind. They have a nearly complete ornithomimus from Dinosaur Provincial Park. It's only missing a few finger and toe bones. Awesome. There's also the largest marine reptile, which is 75 and a half feet or 23 meters long, Shonosaurus, hmm. which is an ichthyosaur from British Columbia. They have, of course, the, maybe you guessed this one, Garrett, the best preserved armored dinosaur. That's a very specific category for a record, but I I feel like Guinness does that a lot. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Boreal Apelta, of course. Yeah, that makes sense. They have the fossil with the longest neck, which is a marine reptile. Alberto Nectes has 73 vertebrae in the neck. For comparison, giraffes have seven. Yeah, but giraffes are like... They have very large vertebrae. Yeah, it's like all the animals. I think most mammals even have seven vertebrae in our necks. And we like just end up stretching them out when we have longer necks. So their vertebrae are like two or three feet long. (laughs) Sure, but 73 is still a lot. (laughs) They're probably much shorter. So it's probably more flexible than a giraffe neck too, which would be nice. And then they have the most complete tyrannosaur skeleton of a gorgosaurus, which we definitely saw that one when Mm -hmm. we visited. I'm pretty sure that's the one that's on our T-shirt on our merchandise store. Mm, mm-hmm. It's the Gorgosaurus. is a really cool one. So we've definitely seen Gorgosaurus and Boreal Pelta. I'm not sure if we saw that nearly complete Ornithomimus. I think so. I think that one might have been in that room where everything sort of looked like art. Oh, yeah, that would make sense. Either there or it would have been in the hall that has like all the (laughs) dinosaurs, which most of those are replicas in that big room. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there are definitely some original fossils in there, too. It's impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's pretty cool. Five Guinness World Records. Were those all recently given? Mm hmm. This year. Nice. And now we're going to go on to our interview with Sterling Nesbitt. But as always, we have an extended version of this interview for any of our patrons. So if you want to listen to the longer version, go to your premium content feed or go to patreon.com slash and you can listen to it in the web app if you prefer that. This week, we're joined by Sterling Nesbitt, who's an associate professor at Virginia Tech in the Department of Geosciences, a research associate slash affiliate of a number of museums, who has over 100 publications focusing on the origin of dinosaurs and their early evolution. Thank you so much for joining us this week. Oh, it's wonderful to be here. And we've read a number of those publications, so... Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's exciting when we got that intro email. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I know, obviously, your focus of your research, uh, a lot of it's on dinosaur origins, early dinosaur relatives, archosaurs, things like that. We have a listener question that I think is very relevant here. So it's the Triassic was full of all kinds of archosaur groups. What made dinosaurs outcompete so many others? 
That's a really big question, and I <laughs> hope to answer a piece of that <laughs> in my entire career. But it's it's one of those driving questions that really helps us put the origin of dinosaurs into context. So I have chosen to study kind of those relatives of dinosaurs that might inform us on why dinosaurs were special. And to be honest, I'll go back and forth saying dinosaurs are not special, <laughs> dinosaurs are special, and then back to dinosaurs are not special, because it's really the context. And it looks like that dinosaurs were just part of this larger radiation of archosaurs and their close relatives, the archosauromorphs, after the end Permian extinction. So in some way, they're just part of this big radiation of reptiles, and they don't actually do very well for their first 15 to 20 to 30 million years of their evolution. So that's why I say maybe dinosaurs aren't that special. <laughs> but now we see some characteristics that we've never been able to see in dinosaurs, like how they grew and how variably they grew also. Mm. And then that pushes me towards the Maybe dinosaurs are special because they were able to grow very quickly and they had so much variation in growth. And maybe they're able to survive this really variable climate across Pangaea in the late Triassic. So I don't know where I am at right now, um, but <laughs> I still think there is something different that dinosaurs are doing. It's really hard to put your finger on. Yeah. Uh, another way of I've been looking at this too is just what makes a dinosaur unique anatomically. Mm -hmm. And the more we look at this, the more erosion of those classic dinosaur characters that we thought were unique to dinosaurs because they keep showing up in their closest relatives. Uh -huh. um, but there is one exception, and I love the exception because it's so easy to show people, and that's that hole in the hip socket or mm -hmm. open acetabulum. That seems to have been holding up as a unique character that all dinosaurs share, and you can still see it in your Thanksgiving turkey. So <laughs> just at the end of next week, I'll be giving my annual lecture about the origin of dinosaurs and right before Thanksgiving. And I always like to show students, not on a turkey, but on a chicken, like this is one character that shows that dinosaurs are different than all other reptile groups, and it's still around today. Yeah, that's excellent. The first one you mentioned, my annual lecture, I was imagining you were around like a Thanksgiving table with your family. Dissecting like, here's the acetabulum. <laughs> <laughs> They've had it enough. I, I don't have to give it all the time anymore, and they just don't want to hear it. But, um, <laughs> the students love it. And instead of doing a, a full turkey, which would be amazing, I just do a, a roasted chicken that I get from Kroger about 35 <laughs> minutes before class starts. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to resist every time I'm, I'm cutting apart a chicken or a turkey of like always looking at different bones mm -hmm. and things. <laughs> exactly and in, in one of my the class i'm teaching right now uh, i just talk about how every one of those bones has history somewhere in dinosaurs mm -hmm. so you can reconstruct when they appear in the the fossil record and most of them are in dinosaurs somewhere so you can trace that history and then of course the students get excited when i tell them they can eat the chicken afterwards <laughs> That is great. Bonus to the lesson. So is the the acetabulum and that hip socket, that's related basically to its upright stance, right? Or is that, do you see that upright stance in some of the other dinosaur morphs and stuff? <laughs> this is where it gets murky again. And this leads me to the, maybe dinosaurs aren't that special. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they have that one characteristic that seems to be in all early dinosaurs and gets retained for so long. We still don't know if that was something that gave them some kind of an advantage because it turns out the way the femur or thigh bone articulates into that hip socket gets transformed in all three major groups of dinosaurs mm. after the common ancestor. So in ornithischian, sauropodomorphs, and theropods, they each turn that femoral head more directly into the acetabulum or hip socket than their common ancestor. Mm. So before that, though, the legs of all these early dinosaurs are underneath their body. 
and their closest relatives do that very well too. And maybe even on the Pseudosuchian or the croc line archosaurs do it in the exact same way. But <laughs> almost none of those Pseudosuchians have that open hip socket, but their femur seems to articulate in a very similar way. So that's, again, one of those examples of when we start looking at what this could have been in terms of an advantage, it it's really hard to tell. Gotcha. But the the Triassic dinosaurs, they they're not that differentiated. And that's one of the reasons we think maybe they aren't so interesting <laughs> because they don't do much. And it is really hard to tell apart a dinosaur from the Norian of Africa, like a Coelophysis like animal from Coelophysis. They are so similar, even though they might be separated by 15 million years, 5 million years, and across <laughs> Pangaea. But they are extremely hard to tell apart. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Especially considering, I know we talk about on our show all the time, like an average species usually lasts a couple million years. So if you're talking 10, 15 million years, it's like you'd expect there to be some changes, but I guess not. I guess it was working for them. Yeah. Yeah, or... exactly. So maybe that's a measure of success, too. <laughs> Pretty much every dinosaur that we find is restricted to that formation that it's found in, that rock formation. Mm -hmm. But they look really similar. So Coelophysids from Petrified Forest National Park, from Ghost Ranch, from Zimbabwe, from South Africa, and even Argentina now. They all look extremely similar to the point that maybe you wouldn't be able to tell if they were different species, if they were all found in one place. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so, it's so strange. You'd think at least being that far apart and in you know such different times, there would be a difference in climate or plants or something that would adjust their evolution a little bit. But I guess not. Yeah, we don't know. And <laughs> we do know that the predatory dinosaurs do a lot better in terms of being able to get around Pangaea in the Triassic than the herbivorous dinosaurs. Mm. And that's been a really neat pattern that's emerged probably over the last 15 years. And I've been part of those research groups. And it, it's been it's been a little revolutionary because Ornithischians were known by teeth across the southwestern U.S., but it turns out those teeth actually were different reptiles. There's an animal <laughs> called Reveltosaurus, which was named only based off of his teeth, and those teeth look really similar to the earliest Ornithischian dinosaurs, but a group I was working with found the teeth in a jaw, and that jaw was attached to a head, and that head had postcrania, that definitely wasn't dinosaur. It's a mm. it's a relative of Aetosaurus, which is on the croc side of the tree. And that one discovery said something like, hey, we can't use teeth because they're highly convergent across all these Triassic taxa. Mm -hmm. We can use them maybe in the Jurassic, but when you have this explosion of reptiles, you have these kind of herbivorous-like teeth evolving again and again. And now we know that they're silosaurs which are close dinosaur relatives, probably, that have very similar teeth as Ornithischians also. So they just keep popping up again and again. Yeah, that's what makes the Triassic so fun, is all that convergent evolution and, at the same time, diverging groups all over the place. It's like the messiest, maybe probably the most difficult part of dinosaurs to <laughs> research, not to mention the fact that good Triassic dig sites are less common. They're, they are less common, but I always say there's less people working on them. So, <laughs> like, I think there are more people working in the Hell Creek Formation in Montana over the summer than everyone combined working in the Triassic <laughs> on vertebrate deposits across the world. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, because I know you've done field work like, all over the world, obviously before the last year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> We've got what Tanzania, South Africa, Madagascar, Argentina, Mongolia, plus the U.S. What's it like going to so many different places? I imagine like the environments are very different, the, the climates, how you work, even. The first way I like to describe my world travels is life changing. 
when I went to Tanzania for the first time as a graduate student, it, it seriously changed my life and helped me understand um, a lot more about the world, not just for fossils, but culturally and geographically. The fossils are absolutely amazing there. And I always love telling the story is I didn't know what to expect in Tanzania. So now we can look at Google Earth. But back in 2007, we had very primitive Google Earth and everything was green. So being from Arizona and growing up in the desert, everything's rock. So you just walk around and pick up fossils. Well, in Tanzania, everything is covered in grass, which I did not know until we got there. So I was imagining these vast exposures like you see sometimes with hominids Mm -hmm. in Ethiopia or South Africa. Not Tanzania. Tanzania is... Occasional tree is what we call it, which (laughs) means that there are many trees. And in between all of those trees is grass that is six to seven feet high. Oh, wow. wow. That's some serious grass. That's almost bamboo status. (laughs) Yeah. In some places there were bamboo and some nasty thing called razor bamboo. Um, But the other side of the coin is when we were able to find rock, we found a lot of fossils. I would say places these Karoo deposits in Tanzania and Zambia would be some of the most fossiliferous places in the world if they didn't have a covering of soil and grass on most of it like Mm -hmm. it just blew my mind because you would spend a lot of time at just a few outcrops but those outcrops would just have so many fossils in them wow I is that was Tanzania, some of the early stuff was found near a lake. Is that right? Did you yeah, go by there's... like a lot of water places to find exposed rock? Not, not, we're not that close to the lake. It's one of okay. the rift lakes on the western side of Tanzania, but it's a basin that's connected to those rift lakes. It goes way back to, to the Triassic and some rift zones and that, but we're, we're about 50 kilometers away from the lake. So mostly what we're looking at are some exposures that are in river cuts. There are a few natural exposures, but they're, they're pretty small. But again, when we found them, and we've gotten better as Google Earth has gotten better, <laughs> we find outcrops, put them in our GPS, and walk straight to them. And it's just been amazing. And that has been life-changing. It in terms of being able to find these dinosaur relatives and animals like a Celesaurus really showed us that there were all kinds of dinosaur relatives that were present before dinosaurs and with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. And then of course, like all the work that we do in the Western U S in places like petrified forest national park and surrounding areas and places like ghost ranch in Northern New Mexico these are just graveyards of early dinosaur information. And even though they're still pretty rare, we get a lot of them relative to other places. So sitting down in what's called the Hayden Quarry at Ghost Ranch in New Mexico, we would find a couple dinosaur bones a day. And sometimes wow. they would be associated skeletons of animals like Ta- Tawahale and some undescribed coelophysids that are found in there but also finding the relatives of dinosaurs like Silosaurs and Lagerpetids in the same beds was just absolutely amazing. And we haven't gone out for a couple of years, or at least our group at Virginia Tech, not just because of the pandemic, but also we have so many fossils that we collected. We we need to spend some time cleaning those bones (laughs) in the lab. For those fossils, because I know that a lot of the fossils that you excavate end up being like digitized, 3D scanned, printed in some cases. Is that like standard now? Everything you find is going through that process? Not everything, but it is a really important part of my job now. We still do some traditional molding and casting, but molding and casting can really damage the bones by adding material or them breaking where scanning surface scanning is good enough resolution that you get most features and you don't really have to add anything to the bone you just have to transport them to the surface scanner for the tanzania project we've been working on we try to scan almost everything we can and we're talking about 
probably thousands of bones by the time we're done. It does take a long time, but the part I'm really excited about is once it's available, it can be shared with anyone instantaneously. And we're going to load it up to the website Morphosource, which has a lot of CT data, but more and more surface data. So anyone can access those so they don't have to travel to Virginia Tech when the bones are here and those Mm -hmm. bones from Tanzania go back to Tanzania to their national museum in Dar es Salaam. Oh, awesome. So we'll have digital copies here and then others would also have digital copies. That's great. That makes it so much more accessible for research. Absolutely. And I'm really excited about the technology just because you can scan a bone in 15 minutes and have a perfect 3D model (laughs) that you could print that day. (laughs) <laughs> that is so great. I realize it was that fast, although maybe I should have guessed because we saw a video of the, uh, was it when they did it to Mantellosaurus? Yeah. So are you doing like a structured light kind of like one of those purpose built scanner things that you just sort of wave around it? Yeah, exactly. And the technology really has only been available for the last couple of years, maybe five years or so. And those handheld ones are amazing. So they pretty much figured out how to scan something from multiple angles and not lose what has already been scanned. So the technology Mm. is just great. It's more plug and play now than it's ever been. And what we use is called the Arctech Spider. And I like to work on Triassic animals also because they're small. And an Arctech (laughs) Spider scanner does very well with pretty small bones down to a centimeter or so. And then up to, I I don't know, I did a Phytosaur skull a couple weeks ago with it. Excellent. That sounds awesome. That sounds fun. <laughs> I think I've, I've seen that thing. I, was They're like $20,000. Is that like the ballpark of what those cost? A little bit higher. So they are expensive, but Virginia Tech has a great engineering program and the libraries at Virginia Tech have scanners that are available to researchers and engineers. So we, we work with them often. I, I bet I'm over there twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent well i mean the but the value of those scans is way way more you know like it's it's almost hard to put a, a number on what the value is of making these things accessible all over the world and giving yourselves a copy when the bones go back to tanzania too mm-hmm. like that's amazing it's really neat too because these scanners also do photogrammetry and map the textures on at the same time so it's not like a cast that's one color it has those original texture colors on the 3D model. So, of course, you can't print those, but you can see them on any computer. Yeah, that's so cool. I keep wondering if there'll be a time soon where rather than doing matrices of like different, you know, characters and like zero for no, one for yes, length measurement, if people will just plop in all of the bones that they think are from the same group and see what like if the computer can analyze all of those features on its own at once. That'd be crazy. <laughs> yeah, it would be. It would put me out of a job, that's for sure. <laughs> I think it would still require a lot of uh, yeah. interpretation. Yeah, <laughs> of, of course. Uh, and yeah, there there are many projects that are being done, not just in dinosaur paleontology, but across all vertebrate or invertebrate paleontology, where there are machine learning algorithms that can capture shape really well. So it might not be a whole skeleton, but it might be a lower jaw or a brachiopod or something like that. And computers can be trained pretty quickly to recognize um, species A from species B. Mm. Mm. That's cool. <laughs> but they can't recognize distortion. And that's, yeah, that's right. the big problem with big dinosaurs or small dinosaurs. They're always distorted in some way. So the, the computer will always have trouble with some kind of distortion. Yeah. Yeah. That's always, especially when you have like a single individual and you're trying to figure out what's unique about that species and there's a, like a twist or a smoosh (laughs) to the bone. It's like, Mm -hmm. is that a real thing or is that a, such as taphonomy? Exactly. And I, I'm excited about that technology because it would take some of the qualitative aspects out of shape analysis that we do all the time. And it could put it in these gray zones too. So like where we saw black and white, the computer can see more shades of gray of something in between. And there might be a a bigger story there of how these characters evolve that are very hard to interpret. Mm, That's a good point. 
So I know you work with a number of graduate and undergraduate students and, and a lot of research groups. How do you end up like finding this, these students to work with and then choosing? Yeah, choosing a student is difficult. There are so many great applicants out there. Sometimes they know exactly what they study. Sometimes they don't. But we want to train as many as we can with the funding restrictions that we have. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we've invested in at Virginia Tech lately is we have an undergraduate pathway in geoscience, which is called the paleobiology option, to study any kind of paleontology that an undergrad would like to. And we just designed that and it was implemented last year. Mm. And we're seeing about 15 students in this first class from that. And what's nice is not everyone wants to study dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. They want to study all kinds of aspects of the history of life. And that's what that program's designed for. When we recruit for graduate students, we're looking for students that are interested in questions and our program, our faculty decide, is that a question that we can help with? Is that something that we have enough background that we could help the student start their careers? Mm. Because my philosophy is once you start being a grad student, you are starting your career as a researcher. And my job is just to help them through the program and help them get a job. Mm -hmm. Cool. But it's really fun working with students because they're the ones driving a lot of the new ideas. And uh, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting was last week and it's uh, it was virtual so you could watch a lot of talks and there's just so many exciting new avenues of research and new specimens that are popping up everywhere so it's this continuous cycle of more and new data and it's it's all really exciting it i really love to see how students get really excited about that and we will we will train them as best as we can from finding specimens in museums to going out to the field to finding new specimens that can be added to museums to mm -hmm. doing all those analyses and drawings and photography and travel. So it's a really fun career and that all really gets started in grad school. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a lot of avenues you can go with that. That's really cool. I never realized that sometimes the question starts with the student. I always imagined like you got into a program and then the the professor or your advisor would say like, how about you work on this? But it's interesting <laughs> to hear that it can go the other way too. That's what I'm actually looking for most of the time. I, I'm looking for students that have a question that they're interested in. And it doesn't have to be very narrow. It could be extremely broad. But I find that the students that have those questions do very well overall because they're driving the, the bus, essentially. Mm -hmm. They are following what they are interested in. And of course, I have some projects that might be related to that, but I never have set projects. I have starter ideas that I work with students to develop those further. And then they they take the reins. It's it's their project. I, I help nudge when I can. Awesome. Yeah. So we do have some more listener questions. Do you feel that the origin of dinosaurs has become more a topic of interest recently? And do you think that maybe that would attract more researchers to study the Triassic? <laughs> this one's really hard to answer unbiasedly. Um, <laughs> totally in your opinion. I would say absolutely yes, just because we know there are so many more species. And we're finding more species of early dinosaurs and their close relatives than we ever dreamed about finding. Not only are we finding new species, but we're finding more specimens of maybe those really poorly known species. And I would even put Coelophysis in that category, because even though Coelophysis is known by thousands of skeletons, there aren't many that are completely prepared out of the rock. Actually, there are only two partial ones that have ever gone through that most of them are still in the rock so you can only see one side of a specimen mm -hmm. and that material is hard to prepare so you need some of the world's best preparators to clean it up really nicely so right now i i do think we're in a renaissance of understanding triassic dinosaurs and their close relatives and the things that they're living with yeah so 
this is this is really neat because not only do we have early dinosaurs, but we have those questions related to why did dinosaurs take off and what were they like compared to their closest relatives for finding even more of those close relatives and the other side of the tree, the sides closer to crocodiles than ever before. And to me, that's extremely exciting. And on top of that, we finally have dates, absolute dates for when some of these dinosaurs appear in South America and North America. And it turns out it's way more complicated than we thought. So (laughs) we thought the North American deposits were about the same age as what we get from the Ishigalosto formation in Argentina, but they turned out to be much younger. So dinosaur evolution is happening at different rates across different parts of Pangaea. And as I was talking about before, where you might have sauropodomorphs or ornithischians in some parts of the world, they are just not found in the low latitudes in North America and the Triassic. There are lots of sauropodomorphs, but they are confined to the high latitudes until either the very end of the Triassic or just into the Jurassic. So lots of discoveries um, can be made. And I really think we've hit the just the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, diversity of a lot of these animals. Case in point, like our number of species of close dinosaur relatives has really gone up in the last 15 years. And I, I would say what really kindled this was the discovery of this animal called Silosaurus mm-hmm. from from Poland in 2003 and I remember reading that paper and saying I think we have these animals in North America too and it <laughs> turns out they were just everywhere and then lagerpetids were found in North America then we found them in everywhere Madagascar all over Argentina and younger sediments Brazil Um, Now I think it's, if you don't find them, there's some weird bias or you're just not recognizing it. So we went from something like four species of dinosaur relative to something like 16 or 17 in the last 15 years. Oh man, that's amazing. (laughs) It is. (laughs) Speaking of early dinosaur relatives, we had a listener ask if you think there'll be earlier finds I mean, you basically already answered that, that yes, there's going to be more finds um, (laughs) because of the tip of the iceberg. But specifically with Nyasasaurus, do you think that's about as old as dinosaurs are going to get? Yeah, I think that's probably pretty close. And (laughs) describing Nyasasaurus, I don't know if it's a dinosaur or a close (laughs) relative. It is very close and there isn't a lot to go on, but what is there is very interesting. It grew like a dinosaur. It had an arm like a dinosaur. It had sacral vertebrae like a dinosaur. But we know those characters aren't perfect dinosaur characters. We've looked very hard for more Nyasasaurus, absolutely, in Tanzania. We don't actually know exactly where it came from because it was collected so long ago. Mm. But we've been all over the place we think the bones were collected from and we haven't found anything yet Uh, we'll keep looking but i think that probably is a pretty good bottom for the oldest age of dinosaurs so sometime in the carnian that's like 230 something million years ago yeah 231 maybe 234 but i would say the late triassic is gonna be pretty safe to say that's when dinosaurs appeared like the Mm. earliest part of the late triassic so then our last question for our listeners where is the best place if they wanted to find out more about you and your work online oh yeah so my virginia tech website tells us quite a bit about what we're doing and what we've done over the last couple years and what we're going to continue to study for sure And then if anyone ever wants to know about more Triassic dinosaurs and dinosaur relatives, I'm always happy to answer questions through email. Cool. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Yeah, anytime. Well, thank you so much again for coming onto our show and talking about the Triassic and all the cool things that go on with that. And of course, answering all of our questions. We really appreciate it. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, 
Paleoskinkus, which was a request from Tyrant King via our Patreon and Discord. So thanks. That's such a fun name. <laughs> it was, you might also like that it was an ankylosaur, although it was dubious. Oh, that's why I haven't heard it before, because n- <laughs> nobody uses the name anymore. It lived in the late Cretaceous and what is now Montana in the U.S., found in the Judith River Formation. It looks like other ankylosaurs. It's often depicted with armor like Edmontonia, with spikes along the sides of the body, and a tail club. It probably had a low, broad body and stout limbs. It was herbivorous. The type and only species is Paleoskinkus costatus. Maybe costatus, depending on where you want to put the emphasis. Mm. Well, the genus name means ancient skink, <laughs> and the species name means the ribbed one. Ancient skink. With ribs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first ankylosaur named based on fossils that were found in the U.S., and it was named by Joseph Lady in 1856, based on one tooth, because he did that a lot. <laughs> this tooth was found by Ferdinand Hayden. And in 1856, Joseph Lady wrote Notice of Remains of Extinct Reptiles and Fishes Discovered by Dr. F. V. Hayden in the Badlands of the Judith River, Nebraska Territories. And that included all of two paragraphs about Paleoskinkus, hmm. including a line that said, quote, The fang is flattened, cylindrical, and is hollow. Interesting. The fang. Eh, the tooth. I wonder if they went with a skink analogy because it's around extinct reptiles and fishes and skinks are sort of like they're all smooth and shiny, sort of like a fish. And they're actually more lizardy than they are like other, you know, we think of dinosaurs now. Mm -hmm. But then they also have osteoderms. So maybe that's the skink connection potentially. But he only knew about the tooth. Oh, weird. (laughs) So it's just it's one of these that's named after just a single tooth. Yes. Oh, no. Well, Lady did describe it more in 1859, and then O.C. Marsh wrote in 1892 notes on Mesozoic vertebrate fossils and said, quote, Many similar teeth have since been found, both in the Judith Basin and in various other localities of the Laramie. So he said that a smaller species was found in Wyoming, and he called that one Paleoskinkus lattice, and said that the crown of the tooth for that one was broader and the apex more pointed, which is why it was a different species. He also said that a tooth cope described as a mammalian premolar back in 1882 and became the type of meniscoesis actually belonged to Paleoskinkus or something similar. That doesn't surprise me. They were always renaming each other's fossils. I'm really bummed that Paleoskinkus isn't a name anymore. <laughs> it's such a fun name. So Walter... Combs Jr. in 2010 wrote Teeth and Taxonomy in Ankylosaurs, and he said that there were five sources of dinosaur teeth variation, positional, ontogenetic, intraspecific, taxonomic, and chimeric. Hmm. Chimeric, meaning <laughs> it's not actually from a dinosaur, or it's from, or it's two from or multiple, more dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah. Some examples of positional variation also include tooth size, number of cusps, where in the dental roll the tooth is from, and ornamentation like grooves or ridges or serrations, which there's a lot more to teeth than I realize. Whenever we read these papers, I rem- I'm reminded. But Yeah, teeth are pretty awesome. It's really useful that they're so hard and they fossilize really well because you can see so much about an animal, especially its diet, from looking at its teeth. So he said that teeth are rarely analyzed with enough detail to name a new taxon based on teeth. I would expand that rarely to ever. (laughs) Uh, There might be some cases. Maybe. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Don't name genera after teeth. Well, anyway, that's why he said that paleoskinkus was a nomum dubium, because Mm. there's just not enough detail to tell the difference based on its tooth. And other paleoskinkus species have since been reassigned. Well, even before 2010, there was Paleoskinkus africanus that was named in 1910-1912 by Robert Broom based on a partial jaw found in the Kirkwood Formation of South Africa, and that's now known as the Stegosaurid Paranthodon. There was also Paleoskinkus asper, named by Lawrence Lamb in 1902, that means the rough one, and that's based on a tooth found in Dinosaur Park Formation in Alberta, Canada, and it's now considered to be Euoplocephalus. There was Paleoskinkus lattice, named by Marsh in 1892, that means the wide one, based on the tooth found in the Lance Formation in Wyoming, and that's now thought to be a pachycephalosaurid. Hmm. Wow, that really, 
<laughs> we're all over the place. We got Stegosaur, Euoplocephalus, and a Pachycephalosaurid. Yep. Euoplocephalus, at least, was an Ankylosaurid. And then the last one, which I guess ended up being most closely related, that's Paleoscincus rugacidens, named by Charles Whitney Gilmore in 1930. That means rough tooth. And that was based on a skull and partial skeleton found in the Two Medicine Formation in Montana. And now it's thought to be Edmontonia or Chastenbergia. And most illustrations of Paleoscincus are based on this skull and partial skeleton, which is why we say it looks a lot like Edmontonia. Gotcha. That makes sense, because especially considering that one included a skull and partial skeleton and isn't just a tooth, that mm-hmm. if you're going to talk about it as a genus, that's the one you're going to have to use for anything other than tooth shape. Because we know it didn't look like a skink. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is that the duck test is wrong. Oh, no. Do you know what the duck test is? Well, I know the saying, looks like a duck, sounds like a duck. Must be a duck. Yes. So the idiom, the way I saw it, mostly written, I always heard must be a duck too. But apparently, at least the ones that I find on various dictionaries and stuff is, quote, if it looks like a duck, swims like a duck, and quacks like a duck, then it's probably a duck, end quote. So the probably is actually pretty good. Yeah. So yeah, that's the duck test. It The claims of its origin vary. I couldn't find any good source that had when it came from and like an early written form of that how often do we know the origins of idioms though yeah that's a good point yeah a lot of times they are pretty hard to nail down but the most common origin or at least maybe one of the times that it rose to popularity is in the u.s from mccarthyism and anti-communist rhetoric which was basically the claim that you can identify a communist by how they look act and who they hang out with oh that's like a duck fun no it isn't and it's also (laughs) famously horribly inaccurate because you know they did nothing but find non-communists by the duck test (laughs) right nobody was quacking (laughs) exactly so the problem with the duck test is it's a form of abductive reasoning which often leads to the wrong results basically abductive reasoning is different than deductive reasoning where you logically follow steps and it gets you to like a single conclusion What you're really looking for is a few superficial characteristics that are combined and make a assertion about what the result is. That you want to deduct. You don't want it to be like a duck. (laughs) I see what you're doing. (laughs) Yeah. Deductive reasoning is better than duck test reasoning. Yeah. 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 (laughs) That's good. I'm glad you got where I was going. Yep. There are a lot of examples of bad duck reasoning also known as abductive reasoning or duck test reasoning and it happens all the time in paleontology one example that i always think of is that if i said there's a mesozoic terrestrial fossil it has large powerful arms and sharp claws it must be a large hyper carnivore which is what many people thought for a long time then they found the rest of the body and found out it's dinochirus the goofy <laughs> humpbacked herbivore or at best omnivore That Jar Jar Binks dinosaur. Yes, (laughs) exactly. So, yeah, the duck test doesn't work. It doesn't even work on ducks and their close relatives. But Does that mean you're going to call me out every time I say this idiom? (laughs) No, I mean, if you say must be a duck, then yeah, that's wrong. (laughs) But if you say it's probably a duck, then I guess that sort of works. It's more fun to say must be a duck than probably it's a duck. Yeah, that's true. We'll see how it goes. I think a more fun and much earlier possible origin of the duck test is from the digesting duck automaton. What is that? So it is a gold-plated copper duck, which was unveiled by Jacques de Vaucanson in 1739. That's interesting. That was back when automatons were all the rage. Automatons are super cool. They're like little self-moving almost like a robot but usually they don't walk or anything they're sort of like fixed in place but they can do different things there's some really cool stuff from japan too where it's like archery where it like shoots little arrows there's all sorts of amazing automatons out there so the digesting duck it appears to eat grain digest it and then poop it out does it poop out gold is it like a golden goose it is not <laughs> It is meant to poop out something that resembles bird poop. Oh, okay. And some people reported it as foul smelling, although I don't know if that's actually the case, because actually what it was pooping out 
was dyed green breadcrumbs. Mm. And the way it did it is it didn't actually digest anything. It would eat the food, basically, you know, bend over, clomp its little duck beak around the food, move its head back. And then the food falls into a chamber. And then from a separate chamber, there's those green breadcrumbs were stored and then it would push them out of that one. So there's two completely disconnected things. There was no digesting happening between the input and the output. And so it, in a way, is more of like a magic trick. It's like it, it recreates what a duck seems to do without actually doing what it does on the inside. So in this way, it's kind of interesting because if the duck test was an idiom back then, it would have been more akin to the Turing test. Essentially, if you make a good enough duck automaton, it's effectively a duck, <laughs> I think would be the interpretation of it. But I couldn't find any actual quotes from people at that time using any sort of language that was like the duck test, other than people supposing that someone might have done it back then. So I think that might not really be the origin. It's just kind of a fun story because there's this really cool duck automaton. <laughs> Although it's not around anymore, unfortunately. It, it burned up in the late 1800s, I think. Aww. There have been some good recreations of it, though, because there are good schematics that were oh, okay. created. That's good. And then one last layer deep down the Erictodromius burrow, because I ran into this when I was researching the digesting duck. There's a Belgian artist, Wim Delfoya, who created what is basically the exact opposite of the duck automaton, because it doesn't look, sound, or swim like a duck, but it can digest food. <laughs> this machine is named the cloaca <laughs> <laughs> or just cloaca and vim says that's because it is like a sewer and had this whole analogy i don't even know if he's aware of the fact that cloaca is the name of something that ducks have among right. other animals and that they do more than poop yeah out of it because the cloaca machine is intended to recreate human digestion which hmm. is a weird choice since yeah. his name Cloaca. But anyway, not a scientist. It consists of a garbage disposal and meat grinder for like the chewing processing. Then it goes into a series of six glass jars filled with digestive chemicals and then pumps and tubing to tie it together. So it looks like sort of a series of IV bags kind of hanging in a room. It, look, it looks absolutely nothing like any actual animal. It's art. And the end product is separated from the remaining liquid and collected in small jars when they run it and sold for very high prices. So you can get your own... Digested food? Yeah, it's basically poop is the goal because it takes a long time for it to go through the process. It probably smells too. Yeah, so it's ridiculous and it's intended to be ridiculous. <laughs> That's the whole point of it. There's a version of Cloaca on permanent display at Mona, the Museum of Old and New Art in Hobart, Tasmania too. Oh, they should get one of those gold plated copper ducks and put it next to it too <laughs> that would be cool <laughs> yeah so i just thought that was a fun random aside that somebody made a piece of art called cloaca that does digest food so much around ducks yep and that wraps up this episode of i know dino thanks for listening if you want to join our growing community head on over to patreon.com slash i know dino thanks again and until next time Good day.